Good afternoon. I am Dr. Weiss, and um, many of you that might be viewing this uh, lecture already have me for a class or have had me for a class. What I have put together for you today is a PowerPoint and presentation, what I'm calling pre and post essay paper key points and grammar organization objectives. Long title here. What is the purpose of this? Well, I teach composition, as many of you folks know, and I teach literature. Now, for the students that I've had in literature class, I sort of know what you were supposed to have been taught. For those of you that I have not had before, I'm not quite certain. So for some of you, this might be a review. Uh, for some of you, there is new information. And if some of this is review, that's a great thing. Sometimes we need to be reminded of these things. The purpose of this presentation is, uh, uh, again, as a sort of general review about essay and some grammar points, the importance of professionalism uh, in writing a college-level academic uh, essay to turn into your professor, and specifically some of the things that I'm looking for. Some of the points in this presentation uh, are things to do before the writing process begins or to engage the writing process. And at the end of the presentation, I have some points on how to read uh, the grading rubric. Uh, so we have a full understanding of what the expectations are. So let's begin. Your paper, when you turn in your paper to me, to another professor, it is like a job interview. Uh, the job interview, you would not uh, uh, stay uh, stay awake for three days at your friend's house. You would not, uh, you know, you would dress up, you would shower, you would brush your teeth. All of the things that you might think about in terms of doing a job interview, you have to think about in terms of turning in your paper. So, uh, if your paper looks like you have put a leash on it and dragged it from your car to the classroom, that's the first thing that I would see. That's the first thing that your professor would see. Uh, it needs to be clean. It needs to uh, be in the right format. It needs to uh, be printed in black color ink, not magenta and cyan. These are the first things that I would see. And when I see these things uh, done correctly, I say to myself, okay, this person is professional. They are taking what they are doing seriously. It is important, whether for me or for any other professor, not just at the beginning of the writing process, but in the middle of the writing process, at the end of the writing process, that you read the paper criteria. What you may remember or think about uh, the, the things that are required uh, in the middle or at the end, you may have forgotten some things. Some things could have been simple to overcome, but if you've forgotten them and turned in a paper and, and did not follow all of the criteria, that could have a negative impact on your grade. So the paper criteria, MLA format. And uh, in my composition classes, we go through at length what MLA format is. And I say to my students, and I'm saying to you, if you have questions about MLA format, you are uncertain, ask before. If you say, okay, I know certain elements of uh, the MLA format, uh, but not others, ask before. You don't want to turn in a paper with unanswered questions. What I have is an example here. Uh, of a paper, random paper that, uh, that I picked out. And this is, again, the first thing that I see here. Uh, you have a paper, it has paragraphs on it, it has a title, uh, it's clean, it's uh, printed in black ink, it has the necessary information uh, up at the top of the page, it has last name and page number in the right-hand corner. This is all part of MLA format. And these are some of the first things that I would see when you turn in your paper. The pre-writing process. Writing is an activity that is very often, uh, very often uh, one might feel anxious, uptight, uh, uncertain uh, about how to start. And the pre-writing process is about following a procedure. So when you decide to sit down, when you say at uh, Sunday morning, at 3.30 a.m. I'm going to write Sunday morning from 3.30 a.m. to 6.30 a.m., which, by the way, is, uh, is often when I do my own writing, a great period of time because there's no one texting you, there's no one calling you, it's nice and quiet. But whatever time that might be for you, um, if you just sit down and say, okay, ready, get set, go, I'm going to write that paper. And then, as you can see from this cartoon, you look at the computer screen and there's nothing there. The anxiety, the uncertainty, 
that might surround the writing process now exponentially increases. What can you do to avoid this situation and improve your chances of success? Well, several different kinds of pre-writing exist, and I'm just going to show you uh, two examples today. One is a simple brainstorm, and I say it's a simple brainstorm because it doesn't have a lot of structure to it. What you do is you take a sheet of paper, or in my case, I often use napkins and scrap pieces of paper, and I just write notes down. And it's a kind of stream of consciousness. You just think of everything that comes to mind uh, pertaining to a particular writing uh, uh, project that you are working on. Any ideas, no matter how disconnected. What you can then later do, and you can see from this example, the student has made some mark, uh, some sort of mark, asterisks uh, on the side in the margin. Once you have, you fill one, two, three sheets of ideas, however many that you need in order for you to feel comfortable, then you, became, then you can begin to group ideas together and see if you are moving in some sort of direction. Now again, some of the topics that we're going to talk about today in a composition class over the course of a semester, uh, we would spend much, much more time. We don't have that sort of time here today, so I'm just showing you two examples. The brainstorm is the easiest thing to get started on, and when students say, Dr. Weiss, I don't know what to write about, I ask them several questions. What particular literary text do you find interesting and that you would want to spend some more time in writing on? And th then they would tell me, give me an idea. And then I would say, okay, this is what I want you to do. I would want you to produce some brainstorming for me, write every idea that you can, bring it back to me, let's look at it, and let's figure out a particular direction. So this would be the first step that I would recommend to you in the writing process. There's also something called a cluster diagram. There's something called a tree diagram. Again, we don't have time to fully go into those today. But at the other end of the spectrum, and I think most of you have either seen an outline or written an outline, an outline is the most uh, organized pre-writing document that you can produce. Does this take a lot more time to produce than a brainstorming exercise? Absolutely it does. What you can do is you start with brainstorming, begin to organize your ideas, and then move on to an outline. Now an outline, as I said, takes a lot more time to produce, um, but the end product, uh, once you get into your writing, uh, more than likely you're going to be a lot more organized. Do you have to produce an outline in its entirety before you start a paper? Ideally, that would be a good idea. But I also would advocate everybody's writing process is a little bit different. Um, it's sort of like a, 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 a batter swing. You know, coaches and, and whatnot have an idea of the best swing in order for you to hit a baseball. But you know what? If you can hit a baseball with that swing and that stance, that works for you. So part of this process is figuring out what works for you. What I would also recommend is you can start writing your paper with maybe even a partial outline. And once you begin generating more ideas, return to the outline, return to whatever form of pre-writing you had previously engaged in and add to it. You can also take your outline at the end of the paper and use it to check against uh, you know, the paper that you've written. Did you follow the outline? Has it changed? Are you staying on point? So I would advocate that you can use the pre-writing form, not just before you write the paper, but even throughout the writing process. Okay, some of the things that we're going to talk about today, some of the uh, errors or things that I might point out, easy to fix. So on, on a list later on in this presentation, I might have spelling errors. Okay. You can do a spell check. You can look to see if things are spelled correctly or incorrectly. Okay, those are uh, fairly minor uh, or easy. I shouldn't say they're minor because those are points that get taken off. But those are things that, okay, I have to think about spelling. I can go through my paper and look for words that look funny or are underlined by my word processing program or what have you. Then there are other, uh, and these are sort of interwoven all throughout this presentation, there are other aspects of writing that are a lot more difficult. In fact, what I would also say in general about writing, some of the things that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, you've heard before. You've heard them in 
first grade. You've heard them in third grade. You've heard them in seventh, eighth, ninth. You've heard them in almost every single English class that you have ever had. And you ask yourself, you know what, I'm a sophomore in college, I'm a junior in college, I'm a freshman, I am in college. Why am I still hearing about these things? And here I think is the easy and complicated answer. Because writing is difficult. You are taking Algebra 2, you are taking Physics, you are taking Differential Equations. Is anybody, is your instructor saying 2 times 2 is 4, 2 plus 3 is 5? Is anybody telling you that? No, because you've mastered those skills. But a lot of the things that you might hear during this presentation you've heard before, but writing is that difficult. And every writing project is a new project. Okay, so coherent writing. Writing that flows smoothly, clarifying relationships between thoughts and ideas. That is one of those sort of abstract uh, aspects uh, of writing. Coherent writing. Making yourself, um, being able to communicate ideas clearly and coherently. Okay, so let's talk about conjunctive adverbs and transitional phrases. Uh, and this is, uh, in many of these things, and I'm going to show you a picture of my grading rubric at the end of this presentation, uh, these things are, I either circle that they need work, or um, uh, I check them off uh, that you uh, satisfy this. What is a conjunctive adverb or a transitional phrase, and why do we need to use them? These words help show the relationship between one thought and another. Let's look at some of these. So transitional phrases that help us uh, uh, show uh, the relationship between one thought and another in terms of similarity. You've heard some of these before, right? In the same way, at the same time, in a like manner, or to show contrast. On the other hand, alternatively, however, results or effects as a result even more. Nevertheless, for this reason, accordingly, to add ideas together. So if you were to Google a list of conjunctive adverbs uh, or transitional phrases, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Um, when I was in ninth grade, my pet dinosaur and I, uh, we got a, a list, a short list, uh, similar to a list that I have here in this presentation uh, of different conjunctive adverbs and transitional phrases. That was in ninth grade, back a couple hundred years ago. And uh, I kept that list uh, not only through uh, high school, but through my undergraduate degree and graduate school. And I, I must have kept that thing for 20 years, and uh, eventually I lost it. Um, there are a lot of them. Do you need to learn all of them? Uh, no. Let's think of Batman for, uh, for a moment here. Uh, Batman has a bat cave. He has all of these great gadgets. Does he take them all with him? No. He has a utility belt. He takes five or six or eight of them with him all of the time. What am I suggesting to you? Learn six or seven or eight of them. Utilize them. These are not sprinkles on a cupcake. You bake a cupcake, you put the frosting on it, and you say, you know what, I'm going to decorate it a little bit more. I'm going to put some sprinkles on it. These phrases are not sprinkles. They need to be baked into the cupcake. And because they help show the reader the relationship between one idea and another, and you as a writer, it helps develop your ideas uh, to communicate these ideas, to generate new ideas when you're showing the relationship between one thought and another. Let me give you some examples. Stephen works long days. He is tired. He goes to sleep early. A series of simple sentences. Let's add, uh, let's look at our utility belt and see if we can add some things to this. Stephen works long days. As a result, he is tired and goes to sleep early. Okay, there is a relationship between the first uh, thought that is being communicated and the second. Let's look at another example. Modernity is taxing on us. We should take a walk. It is sometimes difficult to take a time out. A series of sentences, um, a little bit choppy in having a series of short sentences like that, but uh, let's see what we can do if we change this a little bit. Modernity is taxing on us, semicolon, consequently, comma, we should take a walk. However, it is sometimes difficult to take a time out. Okay? The use of conjunctive adverbs, the use of transitional phrases, again, shows the relationship between one thought and another. Again, you don't want to add these at the end of the paper. I mean, if you haven't uh, baked them in with the cupcake, of course you want to. But add these as you are writing. 
that helps keep your point uh, clear, helps you keep on task, and it helps you understand that which you are writing. Okay. Clarity. This is another. Okay, so we say conjunctive adverbs and transition words. I wrote a paper. It doesn't have it. Fine. We're going to add some of those. Okay, it's going to help it make more sense to me. It's going to help make more sense to my reader. Something that you can do. Okay, conciseness and clarity. This is one of those sort of big topics. Very, very difficult uh, to master. I mean, it's not something that uh, really anybody can master. This is something that needs to be worked on over and over again during the editing process. What do I mean by conciseness and clarity? Writing in an active, uh, writing in a clear and active voice to express ideas without extra words. Extra words sometimes called deadwood. I have an example here. Wordy. This is a wordy example. Uh, I'll read just a little bit of it. it. It is most likely that a true fact that in spite of the fact that the ed educational atmosphere that surrounds our children is a very significant and very important factor to each and every one of our children, so on and so forth. Okay. This is uh, a, a paragraph, uh, long sentences. Uh, it has about 97 words, if I've counted correctly, which is a very difficult task to, to do. About 97 words here. The same ideas, if you eliminate uh, wordiness, can be expressed in 17. The concise example, although quality education is important for our children, comma, some people vote against tax increases for school improvements. Although is a subordinating conjunction, we're going to talk about those uh, a little bit later. When a subordinating conjunction comes at the beginning of a sentence, you use a comma, but the same idea that is being expressed in 97 words is being expressed in 17. Again, is this hard to do? This is very, very hard to do. This is something that needs to be worked on over and over in the editing process. Why is this hard to do? One, because writing is a skill. It is a craft. And we don't talk in concise language. We don't speak using clarity. In the wordy example, we might even speak wandering from one subject to the other. That's the first thing. The second reason why writing with conciseness is difficult is because you have a requirement to write five pages or three pages or ten pages or two thousand words for your essay. What happens if you have written 97 words and you are going to edit for conciseness and now you have 17? What does that mean? That means you have to keep writing. Psychologically, this is difficult. You've gotten to five pages, you've covered all the paper real estate that you need to cover, and now you're saying you have to start cutting things out. That is what I'm saying. Sometimes you write, to write a five-page paper that is clear and concise, maybe you have to write seven pages, maybe you have to write eight pages. When I write, and I'm engaged in the same processes that you folks are engaged in, when I write, I might have an article that's 25 or 27 pages long. I might have to write 35 pages because I'm not writing in clear and concise language. Because I realize halfway through or uh, pages uh, 14 and 15 aren't on topic, I have to cut those. Uh, the word that I might use for that um, is courageous. You have to cut. You write and cut and keep writing. And sometimes this is what you have to do to write concisely. How to achieve conciseness? Eliminate unplanned repetition and contraction, then expansion. As I said, oftentimes we write like the way we talk. We wander, we meander, we throw in extra language. Contraction is to cut out the extra words, pare them down, Maybe you even produce a paper that is all simple sentences, clear and concise, contract, and then you expand. Then you add coordinating conjunctions, then you add subordinating conjunctions, you add commas, you add semicolons, you add transitional phrases. Contract words down, contract sentences down, expressions down, sentences down. Make sure that they are clear and concise and then build them back up. Is this difficult to do? It's difficult to do only insofar, I think, that it is a function of time. How much time are you willing to spend in achieving those goals? Okay, sentence variety. Sentence variety is important because like all things in life, 
Variety creates interest. Your favorite food would not be your favorite food, I would think, if you had it three times a day, every day, seven days a week, so on and so forth, okay? So variety creates interest. Having different sentences also allows you to communicate ideas in different ways. Let's look at these four types of, uh, these four types of sentences, okay? A simple sentence. A sentence with one independent clause and no dependent clauses. Let me back up a second. What is an independent clause? Some of you might live on your own. You might have to pay your own rent bill. You might have to pay your own subscription to Hulu and CBS All Access and Netflix. You have to pay all of those bills. Those get expensive. You might be independent. You live on your own. You pay for all of those things. Or you could be dependent. And if you're dependent, uh, try to stay as long as you can, I suppose. Uh, maybe you're a uh, dependent, you live at home, and somebody pays some of those bills for you. Okay? An independent clause is a sentence. It's a clause that can stand on its own. A dependent clause uh, is a clause that cannot stand on its own. Oftentimes, uh, we would call this a fragment. So, some examples of a simple sentence. My aunt enjoyed the hayride. China's Han Dynasty marked an official recognition of Confucianism. These are simple sentences. Are simple sentences important in your writing? Absolutely they are. I just said this a moment ago. In the process of writing, it's contraction and then expansion. Contract things to simple sentences. Make sure that they are clear. They all don't have to disappear because if you wrote all in complex sentences that we'll look at in a moment, uh, that sort of defies or undermines this idea of variety. So simple sentences are important. A compound sentence. A sentence with multiple independent clauses but no dependent clauses. Think of, for those of you who might have uh, experienced this uh, before, unfortunately, a compound fracture. A compound fracture, if you've broken a bone, a compound fracture is a bone that is broken in more than uh, you know, more than uh, one place, multiple places. A way to think sort of a negative connotation with a compound sentence. I'm not trying to communicate that. Compound sentences are important. A compound sentence, again, uh, multiple independent clauses, but no dependent clauses. The clown frightened the little girl. <laughs> well, of course, the clown, I don't know how old that example is. Of course, clowns frighten little girls and little boys and adults and all sorts of things, but that's a conversation for another time. The clown frightened the little girl semicolon. She ran off screaming. The independent clause, the clown frightened the little girl. If that semicolon wasn't there, there could be a period. If we eliminated the semicolon, put a, a period, then the example in the second part of the sentence, she ran off screaming, that could stand on its own. You have two independent clauses that could stand as their own sentences. What are we doing in this case? You can see I've highlighted it. We are gluing together. We are duct taping. We are combining these two independent clauses with a semicolon to produce a compound sentence. Another way to produce a compound sentence, the motorcyclists departed and they were determined to travel through the many southern states. Okay, so let's look at this again. The motorcyclists departed, period. That could stand as its own sentence. It is an independent clause. They were determined to travel through many southern states. That is a clause that could also stand on its own. What are we doing? Well, we're doing the same thing that we did in the first sentence. Rather than using a semicolon, we are using a coordinating conjunction. The motorcyclists departed, comma, and they were determined to travel through many southern states. Two independent clauses combined together using a coordinating conjunction. Okay, this produces the compound sentence. Now, why would we combine those two independent clauses into one sentence? Well, one, I told you because uh, variety creates interest. It would, we would assume that there is a relationship between the first independent clause and the second because one thought follows the other. So logically, we would see an association even if they were separate sentences. By adding a coordinating conjunction, we are telling the reader that there is a closer relationship in some way between the first independent clause 
and the second. Um, so we can use coordinating conjunctions. How many coordinating conjunctions are there? There are seven. Okay. Uh, these coordinating conjunctions are for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so. When these are used, we use a comma. Two independent clauses connected with uh, a coordinated conjunction produces a compound sentence. Are compound sentences important to use in our papers? Absolutely they are, just as simple sentences are. A complex sentence, perhaps the most common sentence uh, that we write with. It's a sentence with one independent clause and at least one dependent clause. After Mary added up all the sales, comma, she discovered that the lemonade stand was 32 cents short. What do I have highlighted here? After is a subordinating conjunction. It's a subordinate conjunction. When we use a subordinate conjunction at the beginning of the sentence to introduce that dependent clause, we use a comma. In the second example, I have switched the two clauses. Mary discovered that the lemonade stand was 32 cents short after she added up all the sales. The subordinate conjunction, the dependent clause, which is introduced by the subordinate conjunction, is in the second part of the sentence. In that case, we do not use a comma. In the third example, while all of his paintings are fascinated, Hieronymus Bosch's triptychs are the real highlight of his art. While is a subordinate conjunction, it introduces the dependent clause, therefore we use a comma. If the sentence ended, while all of his paintings are fascinating, period, by using the subordinate conjunction on that dependent clause in that way, what do we have? A sentence fragment. How many subordinating conjunctions are there? A whole bunch. Okay. How many coordinating conjunctions are there? A handful. Subordinating conjunctions, these are words that we've heard of before, that we've used. After, although, because, before, even though. So we have to pay attention to how we are using them and where in a sentence we are using them. The complex sentence. <clears throat> is a complex sentence important in our writing? Well, I said a moment ago that the complex sentence is probably the most common, most used sentence that we use uh, to write with. Uh, it, but we want to use it in conjunction with other forms, uh, with other kinds of sentences. And here's the last example. The complex compound or compound complex sentence is a sentence with multiple independent clauses and at least one dependent clause. Catch-22 example. Catch-22 is, wi is widely regarded as Joseph Heller's best novel. Interestingly, Heller, uh, Heller served in World War II, uh, which the novel satirizes, but the zany and savage wit packs an extra punch because Heller has an eye for the absurd. Okay, let's see if we can get all, all of that in there. Okay. This is a long sentence. It has multiple independent clauses. It has a subordinating conjunction because a coordinating conjunction, but we're using a semicolon. We're using a conjunctive adverb, interestingly. This is a long sentence. Do you want to start writing right from the beginning using compound complex sentences? Probably not, because they can get very unwieldy. If we contract our sentences into simple sentences, looking, editing for clarity and conciseness, now we can rebuild. This is like the six million dollar man from the 1970s. He was broken down and then they rebuilt him back up. Do you want to use compound complex sentences in your writing? Absolutely. Do you want to have them every third sentence? Probably not, but this is another tool in the writing toolbox. Okay, what else do we have? All right, we're going to start talking about uh, sections of your paper, uh, what kind of things show up in different paragraphs, what paragraphs are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I see this that uh, you know, we put too many ideas in the first paragraph, that we don't know what sorts of things need to be in this first paragraph. So let's look at some of the characteristics. What does the introductory paragraph do? Well, it acquaints the reader and announces the topic. It's the first impression. Now, when I'm teaching a literature class and when we look at the, the title of the work, um, we look at <clears throat> a little bit of the author's background, one of the first things I ask my students, what is being communicated? What is being told to us in the first or second line? 
These are all, all a part of the first impression. We want to start broad, conversational. We want to engage the reader. We don't want to start with a thesis. We don't want to knock the reader over the head with something uh, overly technical, something very specific, something broad, as if you are sitting down to the table with your, your parents or a brother or a significant other, a friend. You're starting broad. They don't want to hear about Frankenstein. That's not the first thing that, uh, that, that they want to hear if, uh, if you're writing a paper about Frankenstein or, or James Joyce or Cormac McCarthy. You want to start broad. So the reader says, oh, that sounds sort of interesting. Tell me more. Included in the, uh, in the introduction, directly stated thesis. You might have a definition. You might have an anecdote or personal experience. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you could tell a little bit of a story in that introductory paragraph. Sure. Do we want to keep personal anecdotes and the I out of the body of the paper? Absolutely. If it's an argumentation, uh, argumentation or literary analysis, there are obviously other kinds of essays that uh, some of these rules wouldn't apply to. You might have some interesting details. You might ask a question. Would you have a quotation uh, in the introductory paragraph? Uh, not really. In fact, I would say, uh, as a rule, uh, no. Now, one of the difficulties about writing is that you can say, here are all the rules, and here are all the ways that you can break these rules. <clears throat> I try to uh, codify some of these things, uh, so not to cause confusion. And by the way, the sorts of things that I codify for you are some of the rules that I myself abide by as well. Um, I follow these same processes. So do we want to have a quotation? If I qualify that a little bit further, I would say no evidentiary quotation should appear in the introductory paragraph. An evidentiary quotation is a secondary source information material that is used to uh, support your ideas. We don't want to have that in the first paragraph. Okay? That goes to, to, to supporting your argument. You want to have a strong thesis statement, something that you have to argue and prove. It's not a topic. Um, it's a thesis. It's provocative. It's original. Something that you are arguing for. Okay? Uh, some examples or, or some guidelines. If you were reading your thesis to a group of people and the reaction was, uh, yeah, we pretty much agree with that, then I'd say no. Keep working on it. And what I'd also say about the thesis is this is not something that you want to work on for two minutes or five minutes or 15 minutes even. I have students, after I communicate these ideas to them, and say, let's slow down. Let's work on this thesis. It is not uncommon for them to say, Dr. Weiss, um, I worked on this thesis for two hours. Um, that, I think, is fairly common. It is very, or, or I shouldn't say it's fairly common. That should be more common. Sometimes you have to work and work and work, and I work with my students uh, to help them narrowly define their thesis. So anyway, if a reaction to your thesis might be, yeah, we all agree with that, no big deal, high fives all around, then, you're probably, then you probably don't have a workable thesis. No, keep working on it. If a reaction, either by me or a group of students, uh, would be, hmm, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know if I agree with that. So now you prove it to me. Now you might be onto something. Let me give you a couple of examples. This is pertaining to uh, the short story uh, Evelyn by James Joyce, an excellent uh, short story, by the way, in his 1914 collection, Dubliners. Uh, so let me give you some examples. Here's the no example. In Irish, or excuse me, Irish society, in James Joyce's Evelyn was religious. If you were familiar with that story, um, everybody would agree with that. You're not arguing for anything. Let's try something else. In James Joyce's Evelyn, Evelyn was unable to leave with Frank because of her devotion to her father and her dead mother, which was based upon an oppressive Catholic upbringing, particularly hostile to women. Wait a second, are you saying that Catholicism in general in Ireland in the early 20th century was hostile to women? Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. Okay, well now I have something that I can prove to you. You have something now that you can work towards arguing. You might be onto something in that respect. Okay? 
Here is an example of an introductory paragraph. I believe this is uh, uh, based on uh, Gilgamesh. Telling stories, I'm going to move out of the frame here. Telling stories has existed since humans first developed the ability to make verbal sounds. Writing those stories began as soon as the technology developed to capture the stories people had been telling, to record and pass down those stories in perpetuity. Why were those stories important? What do they have to do with us? Ancient works of literature serve many purposes. Some of those texts were sacred to a particular faith, to teach about the gods, or as others believe, this, uh, the one God. Other texts recorded history and the feats of men and women and their everyday lives. Others transmitted cultural values through the extraordinary and the divine. Today, we might call those stories myth. Whatever scholars might classify Gilgamesh as, fiction, theology, myth, it resonated for the ancient Mesopotamians thousands of years ago, and in many of the same ways, resonates today. However, Gilgamesh is a complicated work, and the modern reader must negotiate a current understanding of juridical transgression, law, women's rights, the Me Too movement, against metaphorical transformation which led for Gilgamesh, and thus for humankind, to greater knowledge and understanding. This is against the backdrop of Joseph Campbell's structure of myth, separation, initiation, and return, which Gilgamesh mirrors. Importantly, for the modern reader, the story of Gilgamesh fails to model modern cultural values. The modern reader cannot embrace Gilgamesh as hero, for the crimes Gilgamesh committed early on in the text go unpunished, and his victims' voices are left unheard. Okay, uh, this is a, a portion, uh, a rough draft, I would say. I mean, there's some work that needs to be done on this, uh, something that I wrote as an example for my students some years ago. I start broad. I'm talking about stories in general, this sort of desire for people to tell stories and how those things are recorded. I don't launch right into talking about Gilgamesh. I have conjunctive adverbs. I use different kinds of sentences. I lay out for my reader what my argument is going to be and some of the uh, secondary source material that I might use in uh, arguing uh, for this point in terms of using Joseph Campbell. And I get down to the bottom of this introductory paragraph and even though, here's my argument, Gilgamesh, the cornerstone or one of the cornerstones of all world literature classes in this country, rediscovered in a library in Ashurbanipal in the late 19th century, lost for the ages, an important tale, so many beautiful lines in it. In this particular paper, I'm arguing that Gilgamesh cannot be considered a hero because of his transgressions at the beginning of the text. Okay? So an example of an introductory paragraph. Let's talk about paragraphs. Paragraphs are a series of sentences that develop and clarify one idea. In one piece of writing, they relate to one another to reflect a controlling purpose. <clears throat> this idea of paragraph unity, that every paragraph has one idea in it. And oftentimes I find students, uh, let's say it's a six-page paper, and they write two pages, and they go, I don't know what else to write about. And I read those first two pages, and I say, you have a 20-page paper here because you've thrown in so many ideas into the first few paragraphs of this paper. You have to slow down, unpack them. One controlling idea per paragraph. Okay? Unity. So this is paragraph unity. One controlling idea in a paragraph. You have your interpretations. You have quotations of both primary and secondary source information to support your ideas. Quotations appear in body paragraphs in an argumentation, particularly in an argumentation or in a literary uh, argument type of essay. Minimal plot summary. We don't want to suffer from plot summary syndrome where you are retelling the story, large segments of the story. Minimal plot summary, just enough to set up the context for your interpretation and further your overall argument. We do not want to begin or end a paragraph with a quotation. Now, in other areas of writing, perhaps journalism, in newspapers, and magazines, these rules might be different. But here, you want to set up the quotation. 
you want to have a topic sentence, which we're going to talk about. We want to set up the quotation, and at the end of a paragraph, we don't want to say, here, reader, here's a quote. You figure out what it means. We want to set it up, and then we want to have some sort of comment integrated into the argument. Again, a quotation and a body paragraph is a tool that you use to support your ideas. Every paragraph contributes to the thesis, to the argument. And so why do I have a picture uh, of a bunch of uh, colored blocks here? Uh, not because I'm feeling nostalgic that uh, uh, my boys uh, are too old to play with those, because I think this is a very simple way to understand what a paragraph is. A paragraph is a building block. And you start at the bottom, and you place one paragraph, and then another, and then another, and you make your way to the top, okay? This is how you produce a successful argument. These are building blocks. Another, uh, another metaphor that I often use is that you, as a writer, have to take the hand of your reader, these days, metaphorically, certainly, taking the hand of your reader and moving them step by step through this process of making your points to your argument step by step like building blocks okay what else do we have topic sentences oh my goodness we have heard about topic sentences our entire life what is a topic sentence states the main idea of the paragraph tells you what the paragraph will be about this is one of those things I think are very difficult about writing where can a topic sentence be well you look in a grammar book it'll say the topic sentence most commonly is the first sentence of the paragraph or it could be in the middle, or it could be the end. What I tell my students, let's not complicate it. Writing is difficult enough. Let's put that topic sentence as the first sentence of each paragraph. The topic sentence tells the reader what the paragraph is about. Every sentence of that paragraph should contribute towards the argument, but can in some way is, uh, is in some way related to that topic sentence. All of the ideas in that paragraph. How do you stay on task? Well, here I have an example. Uh, I have an example of a paragraph and I've highlighted the topic sentence of it. This is what I do. I go through my entire paper, an article that I might be writing. I advocate for you to do the same. You take a highlighter, you highlight the first sentence of every paragraph if this is, and I think it should be, your topic sentence. And now you can just pick any paragraph you read the topic sentence and read every sentence in that paragraph. Does it fit that topic sentence? Spread out all your pages on the ground, not on the computer. We'll talk about that in a little bit. All of the pages on the ground, you read every topic sentence, you can read every paragraph, you can read for uh, the controlling idea, again called paragraph unity. The length of paragraph, uh, the length of a paragraph or the number uh, that you should have for uh, paragraphs uh, in a paper. Now, technically, a paragraph, the length of it could be one sentence long. If you were writing a, a, a short story, let's say, uh, a little bit of dialogue is considered its own paragraph. Um, and again, this is what I think makes uh, writing very difficult. The length of a paragraph depends on how much space you need to support your idea. However, every page needs to have paragraphs in it. When I turn a page over and I see that there's only one paragraph, I think to myself, am I reading William Faulkner? Am I reading Absalon, Absalon, where paragraphs go for pages and pages and pages? No, because that's very stylistic. In an academic expository writing and writing and argumentation, we're not really interested in style. We're interested in, in content. We're interested in substance. Psychologically, I want you to think about this. If you're reading a book, an article, and you open the page and there's only one paragraph, what do you do? I think most of you would get a bookmark and, I don't know, uh, go for a walk or text for three hours or maybe play Call of Duty for 10 hours or whatever you might do. But when you get to that page that is all one paragraph and it even goes on to the next page, you say, you know what, I'm going to stop. I'm going to take a break. Psychologically, it's hard to overcome. What does it mean in terms of writing? It means that you probably have uh, too many ideas in one paragraph, that that paragraph needs to be broken up, that you need to create a new topic sentence wherever you might break up that paragraph. 
If all of the ideas are for one topic sentence and paragraph is long, then the topic may be too broad, too general. You have to break that down, separate those things. Okay? How many paragraphs do you need for a paper? I, I get asked this question a lot. If I'm assigning a four-page paper, maybe a five-page paper, maybe a three-page paper, I don't know. Students will say, well, I got an intro paragraph, a concluding paragraph. How do I fit all of these things into uh, three paragraphs? We're not writing, at least for me, we're not writing five-paragraph essays. How many paragraphs you need? However many you need uh, to communicate the ideas in the service of your argument. Okay? But when you open up a page, I think that you should have some paragraph. Okay? Concluding paragraph. What kinds of things show up in a concluding paragraph? Concluding paragraph signals the discussion has been completed, drives the point home. You do not introduce new material. Now sometimes in the writing process, we don't even know what we're writing about the first couple of pages. Sometimes for some of us, it's not until we get halfway through or we get even to the end. Or by the end, we're really rolling and we start to think of new ideas. I often find that there are new ideas introduced in the service of the argument that are introduced in the concluding paragraph. You don't want to have those ideas there. What do you do with those ideas? You put them back in to the body of your paper. Okay? So do not introduce new material. A restatement of the thesis. A summary. Uh, not all of these. Uh, so some of these are different ways of saying similar things. But a restatement of the thesis. A summary. Uh, this is the last impression. First impression, last impression. Concludes the argument, but your discussion may bring up other questions. You can have questions. You can ask the reader, well, my argument pertains to this specifically, but these items, which are not in the purview of this argument, are still worthy of discussion, are still worthy of consideration. You can bring up some of those questions in your concluding uh, paragraph. Quotation. Mm, not really. Same sort of thing as uh, in the introductory paragraph. You don't want to have any evidence presented in the concluding paragraph. And this includes a quotation. You might have a hope or a recommendation. Uh, I have an example here of a concluding paragraph. Uh, you can take a, a moment uh, to take a look uh, at this. And it sums up this particular uh, argument and uh, sort of broadens questions uh, as this concluding paragraph uh, ends. Okay, So something for you to uh, maybe uh, stop and pause and take a look at. All right, what else do we have? Oh, citations page. Um, <clears throat> when I ask my students who enjoys creating a citation page, nobody raises their hand. And you know what? I'm not upset by that. Uh, a works cited page, a citations page, is uh, often a difficult activity to do. Let me tell you about uh, a works cited page, a citations page. First of all, these are not activities, um, these are not creative writing activities. Um, if you don't know something, you're not creating new format. You're not changing font. You're not aligning things in the center, justifying in the center. You're not making things up. It's not a creative exercise. A works cited page, your works cited page, should look like every other works cited page done correctly. First of all, it should have a title, uh, something like a citation page or works cited. You can see in the upper right hand corner, last name and page number. It follows the pagination of the rest of your document. Um, Format on this example is fairly close, but you have, uh, pay attention uh, to a couple of other items here. The entries are alphabetized. Um, the entries are, are formatted in what is called a hanging indentation, meaning that the last name of the author or the source, uh, the beginning of the entry is on the left-hand side, and every subsequent line of that citation is indented in. So it's reverse, if you will, uh, of the rest of, uh, rest of your writing. Just like a math problem, if 
you loan somebody a thousand dollars and they paid you back with a hundred because they moved the decimal, uh, decimal point over, is a hundred dollars what you would accept? Because if it is, can you loan me a thousand dollars? I think most of us would say, no, you can't move the decimal point over. In the same way, every period, every comma, uh, things that need to be uh, italicized, the container, large poems, uh, books, uh, the names of TV shows, the container needs to be italicized. Shorter works, the name of an article, the name of a poem, those would have quotation marks. All of those things are important. All of those things are important. There are different formats for different sources, but all of them contain uh, relatively the same information. The author, the source, the container, uh, the volume, uh, if we're talking about an anthology, uh, page numbers, so on and so forth. There are formats for interviews, formats for YouTube videos, all of those sorts of things. Okay? I'll also tell you this. When I get your paper, and I talked uh, early on in this presentation, when I get your paper <clears throat> that this is like your paper is your job interview. You show up, are you on time, uh, do you know the name of the company, do you know what uh, the position is for, all of those things. It's a job interview. So I look at the first page of your document. Does it have a title, last name, page number? It doesn't always have to have that on the first page. The necessary information on, on the upper left-hand corner. I look at your Works Cited page. That is one of the first things that I look at. And when I see a Works Cited page that is in the proper format, that it is alphabetized, that you have the, the correct number of sources that are required by the paper, that it looks professional, I say to myself, this is a serious student. I cannot wait to see what the student has to say in their paper. When I look at your citations page, and again, it's written in different colors, and it's not alphabetized, and you've sort of made things up because you weren't familiar with the format, I say to myself, I'm in some trouble. And I think you might be in some trouble too. Okay. One of the difficulties that I find students have with a citations page is that they leave it until the end. They leave it for the night before. And I always advocate uh, of the construction, of the creation of a citations page as you're writing the paper. Don't leave it to the end. Because I'm telling you, uh, you know, as your professor, if I was your professor, I look at this first. Okay? Let's talk uh, a little bit about editing. The rough draft. Um, what can I tell you about editing? This takes a long time. Oftentimes we think that I've spent three hours, I've spent four hours, six hours, whatever it might be, and I've written this paper. Boom, I'm almost there. I have an hour of uh, editing. I'm going to you know, uh, try to find some comma splices. I'm going to fix some spelling words. You're just beginning, okay? You're just beginning. And I've sort of thought about how to conceptualize the editing process. And this is a number that I came up with, and, and I don't know if it holds uh, in, in what percentage of cases. This number is three times, okay? If it took you four hours, four hours to write a rough draft, maybe you need three times the amount of time to edit that paper than it did you, uh, that it did to write that paper for the first time. So what am I telling you? If it took you four hours to write a paper, do you need 10 or 12 hours to edit that paper? You might. You might. What I'm also telling you, if it took you four hours to write the paper and you have a rough draft, you got more than an hour or two of editing. You're just, you're just beginning. Okay, what else about the editing process? Read your paper out loud. I advocate for this uh, all the time. Read your paper out loud. Even if you don't know all the grammar rules, your ear hears things. You can be like, you know what? I'm not really sure that sentence made sense. I'm not really sure that that sentence sounded right. So there must be something to it. My ear figured it out. Read it out loud. Print it out. And I would challenge you to do this as an experiment. You've written a paper. You print it out. Or excuse me. You, you've written a paper. Edit it on the computer. And you go, I think I'm good. Now print out that paper and edit it again. 
in most cases, I think you'd be very surprised at how many more edits that you can make. It's very difficult, I would argue, to edit on a computer. It has to be done sort of the old-fashioned way, <laughs> the old-fashioned way, which is print it out on a computer and mark it up, like my examples that I have for you here. I think that's uh, an edited page from the manuscript of um, Orwell's 1984. Workshop. Writing is often collaborative. Now, I'm not saying that you share uh, sentences with other writers. That's not what you want to do. That's something completely different. That's plagiarism. But when you open up a book, and sometimes there's a dedication, and maybe the dedication is, uh, I'd like to thank my two children who are two and four, and my dog Fluffy. Okay, well, the children didn't really have a, a large hand in editing. Maybe they did. The dog, maybe, maybe not. But oftentimes you'll open a book, a study or whatnot, and I'll say, I would like to thank, and there are five names, there are 10 names, there are 20 names. Maybe there's three pages of names. What is that all about? That means the writer has taken that manuscript, that article, and sent it to different people and gotten feedback. That's what the, uh, the, work, uh, that's what the workshop experience is about. You might do that in your own composition classes. I know that we do that in my composition classes. We don't have time to do that in my literature classes. But I advocate, turn around, meet somebody, make a friend. Rumor has it, friends are nice to have. I've heard that before. Make a friend in class. Exchange some, uh, you know, information. Say, you know, my name is so-and-so. Um, papers due in two weeks. Uh, you want to exchange papers? Maybe we can get together 15 minutes before class. Let's bring in another classmate. Let's switch papers. Let's help one another. I think it's a valuable, valuable experience. If time allows, take time off, come at it again. And this is where, you know, in a semester or if you have a short period of time when the paper was assigned, this can be difficult. Writers, professional writers, uh, novelists, uh, poets, uh, people that even write for newspapers, uh, myself, I'll write and I'll put it away for three, four, five months. Uh, I'll put it away for a year. I think, oh, you know what, I love this. I've written the greatest thing known to humankind. And then six months later, I'll pull it out and I'll be like, Ugh. Glad I didn't send this to my editor. Not so good. Do you have that sort of time? Not really. But could you get started on your writing so you could put it away for two days and pull it back out? I think that you could. Okay, <clears throat> many of you I think have seen this before. This is a little bit of a guide as to what you might see when you get a paper back uh, from me. Uh, this is a, a sort of list of codified proofreading marks. Uh, I don't use all of them. I use a handful of them. Uh, I might use uh, what's called a caret, uh, which is an upward arrow uh, with a word above it, meaning that this is, uh, this is a, a word that needs to be uh, inserted. Uh, I might use at the bottom of this uh, uh, page, uh, of the larger page, uh, this uh, character, meaning paragraph. I might put long paragraph, or in the middle of a paragraph, uh, put this notation here to indicate that you should break this paragraph off uh, or up with another paragraph. I might use AWK, which is shorthand for awkward. I might write FRAG for fragment. I might circle something. So there are some marks on a paper that I might turn back to that have some of these marks. We need to be aware of this. Uh, I might write uh, circle a word and put WC for word choice. So uh, there are a series, a handful of these that I might use. I also have my own shorthand. Two, uh, two examples here. Two, uh, two sentences. Consequently, the reaction that townspeople in Frankenstein had to the monster was a reflection of the ugliness that existed within their interior cells. Great sentence. That came from one of my students' papers. And uh, oftentimes students say, why is there a, a check mark next to that sentence? So this is more of a sort of a personal guide. I can't say this is what everybody does, but more of a personal guide as to some of my uh, notations. Uh, check mark? I dig it. I like what's going on. What you've written there, I like in any number of ways. And um, in another way or another example, here's a, a sentence. 
reaction, townspeople and Frankenstein reflected, monsters, ugliness within reflections. There is a whole lot going on uh, incorrectly in this, uh, in this sentence. Uh, what have I done to this? Uh, I put a squiggly line underneath it with a question mark. A lot of things going on. I've put uh, insert the. I've circled uh, an absence of uh, ending punctuation. I've just written the word grammar. So this is also a kind of shorthand that I might use uh, to indicate. Uh, sometimes I circle things or put squiggly lines underneath things to indicate something is amiss. Sometimes I will do that and then specifically address or try to fix or make suggestions on how you can fix whatever is wrong with that sentence. Common errors as we're coming in for, uh, coming in for a landing here. Common errors that I find uh, in uh, student papers. Just sort of a, a list for us. Some of these I've covered, some of them I haven't. Again, I cannot cover everything in one, uh, in one lecture. This is a, a semester or two uh, of composition touched upon in various ways in a very short presentation. Common errors, thesis is too broad, uh, formatting issues of the citation page or of uh, quotations, spelling errors, comma splices, uh, missing conjunctive adverbs or transition words, improper comma, use, uh, comma usage, uh, logic, things just don't make sense, clarity of sentences or logic uh, you know, relating to clarity, read out loud, avoid words of uncertainty. I think this means, it seems it might, perhaps, well, I believe. Using what I call words of uncertainty introduces into your argument some confusion, some ambiguity. And what your job is to, what your job is, is to convince the reader, to persuade the reader of your argumentation points. If you were in front of a judge, and some of you may have had to have uh, been in front of a judge before, uh, let, for speeding, and you say, Your Honor, I don't think I was speeding. The judge is going to say, well, I think that you were, so pay your fine $250 next. You have to be concise. You have to be clear. You have to make strong interpretive statements. By using a word of uncertainty, oftentimes you introduce uh, an overall uncertainty into your argument. Uh, the paper might wander, does not stay on point of argument, not sure what you are arguing, and if you're not sure what you are arguing, I'm not sure what you're arguing, not using quotes both from primary and secondary sources, um, maybe you don't give yourself enough time to write, perhaps you do not give it your all. And I would suggest to you not to change the hearts and minds of you folks of whatever that you're studying. Not to say we all need to be English majors, because that is not what I would advocate for. But whether you are writing a paper or any other task, do it to the best of your ability. Do it to the best of your ability. And writing a paper for me or another instructor, give it what you can. This is what uh, a grading rubric looks like. Uh, many of you have uh, seen this before. Uh, if you've uh, written a paper for me, uh, you've received one of these. And you can see on the bottom, there's a kind of shorthand list, paragraph unity, thesis, introductory paragraph, concluding paragraph. Uh, I notate in the various areas of the paper uh, things that uh, might need to be worked on. I give that a score. I circle things or make check marks at the bottom uh, so you have an understanding of what some of the comments in the paper might mean. Okay, I hope that you found this uh, helpful. I would advocate that you uh, look at this presentation before you write your papers, and this will also help you understand uh, the, the sort of grading uh, notes and how I came up with some of your grades after you've re uh, received the paper, and also how to uh, have a plan to make improvements in the future. Thank you.